Uh, Sun Chin knows more about the Legislative Council than I do. Uh, okay, uh, good morning everybody. A uh, great pleasure of mine to be here. Uh, as Sun Chin has told you, I'm going to talk about political leadership. Now, I have no idea why any one of you would be interested in political leadership. <laughs> huh? Those of you who, uh, who have the potential to become political leaders one day uh, don't need anybody to tell them about political leadership. Whereas uh, for most of you who I believe uh, would not be interested in uh, going into politics at all, uh, I apologize. You have to uh, be patient with me <laughs> in the next half an hour or so. Um, well, I'd be very glad to uh, switch over to mathematics if you prefer. <laughs> now, I guess, <clears throat> well, first of all, um, the fact that I'm going to talk about political leadership to you doesn't mean that I regard myself as a political leader. Uh, the president of the Legislative Council is never regarded as leader of the council by any of his colleagues in the legislature. Um, the members choose the president to take care of the meetings, to make sure that everybody <clears throat> will act in accordance with the rules. So the members will only listen to the president when he is enforcing the rules of procedure when he is keeping order in the meeting. <clears throat> uh, now, I actually I have been to a number of uh, uh, occasions on which I was asked to talk about political leadership, and I naturally I have to do some research. I found the um, um, most commonly agreed qualities of good political leaders. And then I look at the uh, political leaders I know, and I find that I cannot find those qualities in those leaders at all. <laughs> the qualities include, for example, honesty. <laughs> Tell me the name of a politician who is honest. Oh, see why? Thank you very much. <laughs> or perhaps Donald Trump. All right. So honesty, integrity, well, compassion, flexibility. Well, these are supposed to be qualities that a good political leader should possess. But uh, well. Um, I guess it is, it is uh, 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 precisely because these qualities are seldom found in political leaders that they need to talk about them. But, well, I have to spend the next half an hour talking about political leadership, so I have to, I have to tell you something. Now, I believe that the qualities of a political leader, of a good political leader, may be um, divided into three categories, three groups. The first are the skills and abilities a leader is supposed to have in order to be a good leader. Well, to be a leader, of course, you must first of all be good at what you are doing. You cannot be a general unless you're a good soldier, right? Is that the case? And well, if you want to be the head teacher, you must be a good teacher yourself. Is that true? However, um, being a leader does require some additional skills and abilities to um, your competence in your work. Um, <clears throat> not every good 
soldier can become a general, and there is only one head teacher in a school which may have many uh, good teachers. <clears throat> so you need some specific skills and abilities in order to be a, a good leader. This is the first set of qualities, skills, abilities. The second set, I would call uh, personal traits. You may be very good at your work, you may possess all the skills, abilities to be a good leader. However, uh, some people are simply not, not fit to lead, not fit to become leaders because of their personal traits. Say, if you're a, a really very uh, shy person, for example, you dislike talking to people, then although you may have very good language skills, um, <clears throat> you can't make a good leader. So, personal traits, this is the second set. Thirdly, we do have to talk about moral integrity. We do have to talk about uh, uh, ethics, ethical principles. So <clears throat> let me uh, talk briefly about each one of these sets. The first, abilities. What abilities and skills must a good leader possess? Now, I would say the most important skill is that of communication. Because leadership is, first of all, about communication. Now, if you're working entirely on your own, or if you are Robinson Crusoe, hmm? uh, trapped on an island without anybody else, you have to look after everything yourself, so you don't need to communicate with anybody. There is no uh, sense talking about leadership. However, as soon as Man Friday appears, you have a team of two, and if you want to lead that team, if you want to lead Man Friday, you need communication. You have to communicate with them. So, communicative skills, skills to communicate effectively with people, I believe uh, this is the first, and perhaps most important skill a um, political leader must, uh, must have. Now, when we talk of communication, we shouldn't forget that Communication is always a two-way uh, process, a two-way activity. Um, a while ago, I went to a seminar <clears throat> and listened to an Oxford professor talking about, about leadership. And she said she went to a number of training programs, leadership training programs, and she was surprised to find that Whenever people talk about communication, whenever uh, communication skills featured as a, 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 a topic in the uh, leadership training programs, they only talked about speaking skills, hmm? public speaking, effective speaking, how you can convince people how you can put across your ideas clearly, forcefully, right? Always talking about giving, speaking skills. And she said, nobody ever talked about listening skills. She said, she kept telling people, <clears throat> it's time you started to train people's listening skills if you want them to become good leaders. Now, after her speech, I asked her, uh, Professor, were you talking about listening skills in a sort of a metaphorical way? It means you, you don't seriously mean that people should be trained in listening. You're only stressing the importance of listening. But she said, no, I was serious. It was not it was not only metaphorical. Listening is a specific skill which has to be learned. You have to be trained in it. Some people 
always listen without hearing anything. Hmm? They can listen to you lecturing on and on, but afterwards they haven't heard a word. But they haven't absorbed anything you've told them. So listening is important. Why is listening important? Because when we talk about communication um, in leadership, you have to, the, the, the most important purpose of communication is to build up a strong working relationship, cooperative relationship with every member in your team, in the team you lead. In order to do that, it's not only important for you to make everybody understand your instructions, understand what you want to tell them, but also understand your team members as well. You must learn about their hopes, their aspirations, their fears, their worries, in order to lead the team well. So communication, two-way communication, this is very important. This is the first uh, important skill I believe a good leader must possess. Secondly, a good leader must have the ability to make decisions, including very difficult decisions. It is the res responsibility, it is the one very important duty of a leader to make decisions. You may be a very, uh, you may lead in a very democratic manner. You ask around for people's views. You listen carefully. You communicate with everybody. You listen to what they believe the team should do. However, when it comes to making decisions, you must take it in your hand. You cannot leave it to others. That is the job of the leader. Um, <clears throat> when I when I was working with the first chief executive of the SAR, Mr. C.X. Tong, he, he's a really very nice man. Hmm? Very kind, avuncular gentleman. But when it comes to decision making, very often he's very, uh, very annoying because he seldom makes decisions quickly. Hmm? Many people would give him advice he listened to the advice and then he said, okay, I'll consider your, your, your points carefully. And then he disappears and nothing comes back, right? So many of his advisors described him, described our um, dear old Mr. Tong as a kind of black hole. You put things in, never come back. <laughs> but that, that's not the way to lead. Now, from time to time, you may have to, a leader may have, may have to <clears throat> make some very difficult um, decisions. And you can't be sure that you're always right. But even if you haven't decided which way to go yet, you have to show your team members that you know what you are doing. You have to make them believe that you're going to lead the way anyway. So make decisions, especially the more difficult decisions. This is a, a very important, and, and you have to practice doing it. If you find yourself in a leadership position, and after a period of time, This is the quorum bell in the Legislative Council. <laughs> you know that? The quorum bell, it, it haunted me for eight years and now it's still haunting me. <laughs> is it? Is that a signal for me to, to shut up? <laughs> okay. Now we are talking about um, making decisions. The third 
ability that uh, um, 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 I believe a good leader is required to possess <clears throat> is the ability to handle, to cope with unexpected situations, accidents, to manage crisis. Now, even the best laid plans can go wrong, right? You plan a very um, important function meticulously. You went into every detail and you were satisfied that everything is going to be all right. And then suddenly something you never expected happened. Right? You had a long spell of very fine weather and suddenly there was, there was a typhoon and suddenly there was a storm. So, and the function was supposed to take place outdoors. So you have to. You have to improvise, you have to go to contingency plans, and those who are not very good leaders very easily panic in front of unexpected uh, surprises. And as a leader, you can never panic. Hmm? A, a, the captain of a ship, the captain, is most required by his crew when a storm comes, right? A bad captain disappears when a storm comes, leaving the crew running around not knowing what to do. So it's important when there is a, an emergency, when things suddenly go out of hand, the leader must be Visible, the leader must be there, like a like a like a rock, giving confidence to everybody. Now, this is the um, I believe some of the more important skills that and abilities that a political leader should possess. Now, apart from these abilities, <clears throat> let's talk about personal traits. Some people, uh, well are born, naturally born, to become good leaders. They have the necessary, they have the right personal traits. I'm not one of these people because, believe it or not, when I, when I was your age, I was one of the most the shy boy in my class. I never wanted to, uh, um, you know, make friends with strangers, shake hands with people I don't know. Of course, you can learn these skills. You can learn this, uh, um, 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 the ways to, to deal with various kinds of people. However, um, for those who are born with the right traits, it will be much easier to become a good leader. Um, for example, we find that most good leaders are very confident in themselves. Confidence is something a good leader must possess. You, you must be sure of yourself before you can make others believe in you. If you are never sure of yourself, then you cannot inspire confidence in other people as well. So, I believe confidence is something more of a personal trait than uh, a, a trained um, ability. Confidence. Secondly, most good leaders are very good at um, making friends with people. We can, we may call that um, <clears throat> agreeableness. Hmm? People like to make friends with him. And he is very comfortable making friends with all kinds of people. Now this is important because a leader must be fair, must be seen to be fair to every member on his team. Now, as human beings, I think it is natural that we find 
some of those around us more um, more pleasant. You you would be more willing to make friends with some of them. Others, you don't know why, but but you, you simply dislike them uh, at first sight. Hmm? Now, as a leader, as a leader, you do not have the luxury to choose your team members. Well, you, you can choose your team members, but once the team is formed, you have to work with all of them. And you have to treat them all fairly. It is so easy for us to uh, become very close with those who agree with us uh, most easily and sort of distance ourselves from those who tend to um, uh, disagree with us more. But as a leader, you have to get in touch. You have to work together with everybody. And again, this is a pers personality trait. Some people can make friends with almost everybody, all kinds of personalities, mm -hmm. while others, if you are too um, particular about making friends, if you can only get friendly with some of those people around you, then you may find it difficult to lead your team. Uh, you may find it very difficult to treat everybody fairly, and that will not um, uh, be a good thing to, the, to, to team building. And if we take one step further forward, <clears throat> good leaders, most of them, are likable people. Hmm? They are likable. Now, I, I, I've seen a, an, an article which said that <clears throat> if you look if you look at uh, the, the presidential elections in the United States in the last decade or so, no, not only the last decade, in the last uh, half a century or so, <clears throat> uh, according to the writer, every time it was always the more likable candidate that was elected. Hmm? <laughs> ah, Donald Trump. <laughs> Is he likable? Now, for those, for those who think that Donald Trump is not likable at all, I can tell you many of my American friends told me Hillary Clinton was even less likable. So if, if you have to choose between the two, still it is the more likable one. And you see, <clears throat> according to that, to that writer, Bill Clinton was very likable. Even George Bush was likable. And, and Obama agreed as well. I mean, Obama, of course, is a very likable person. Uh, Obama once said that he was a little bit surprised to find that George Bush was a very likable person. Right? <clears throat> so likable, likability. This is important. Because being a leader, you would want others to come and work with you. If people really enjoy your company, if people really enjoy, you know, working together with you, then it is a very important uh, factor for the success of the team. So being likable is important. And I, uh, I believe that uh, <clears throat> likability can be trained. Hmm? Yes, it is a personal trait, but you can sort of enhance your personal likability if you pay attention to you know, some of the things that most likable person would do and things which they would not do. For example, I believe that humor, humor is an important element in, uh, in being liked. Hmm? Humorous people usually find it easier to make friends with others. They can usually sort of uh, uh, get out of difficult, embarrassing situations more easily than others. And of course, it is always uh, um, greater fun to work together with 
a humorous person than one who has no humor at all, right? So humor, I think, is one, one element in uh, likability. Another is humility, modesty. Arrogance is never uh, liked by others. So if you want to be a good leader, if you, you want to be a popular leader, liked by your uh, team members, be careful. Make sure that no matter how good you are, no matter how successful you have been, remind yourself, never be arrogant. Never lose your humility. Always remain humble. Always remain modest. And that will make you uh, liked by others, make you popular among your members. Another word which I can think of, also beginning with H-U, is humanness. Being human. All likable um, leaders never pretend to be superhuman. They never try to play God. They are seen by their colleagues as similar to their own kind, a human. Having all the human weaknesses, like everybody else. So, don't ever try to hide your human weaknesses. Let others understand you. Uh, give way to your own emotions from time to time. Let people understand that you are as emotional as they are. That uh, sometimes <clears throat> you can be uh, um, you can be despondent. You can you can be very uh, sad. Um, not always um, as strong as a, a good leader is supposed to be. So remain human. That will make you more likable to your, to your colleagues. Now these are some of the personal traits, I believe, which uh, can be um, useful for a leader. Finally, we come to the uh, moral standards, the moral integrity of a leader, which I believe is perhaps uh, most important on the one hand, and also most easily forgotten on the other. Important because if you really become a good leader, the more influence you have, the stronger an influence you have on your team, the more willingly they listen to you, the more important that your decision must be for the good of the community, for the good of everybody, and not for your own personal gains. More important that every decision you make must be right, must be just. So, we have, I think I have just mentioned a few of the key words. Honesty is important. This is difficult. This is difficult for a politician. Hmm? Remaining honest. I think, again, um, Barack Obama <coughs> wrote very um, um, cogently on this point. Uh, I, I've read his book, um, The Audacity of Hope. Have you heard of this book? It's uh, Obama's second book. I've read it many, many times, especially the chapter on politics. And he explained very convincingly why it is so difficult for politicians to remain um, genuine, remain honest. Because the reality is that if you make a wrong move, if you say an improper word in front of the camera, it may, de it may do you more harm than many years of evil doings on your part. So, Obama said, 
very soon a politician will accustom himself to, you know, preparing, editing every word he says, even every um, expression of emotion. A politician will very soon learn to shed the tear at the right time, to give a smile at the right time, right? To show anger at the right time. Everything, every word he says, every expression he allows himself to, uh, uh, to make in front of the camera must be for the purpose of getting more popularity among the people, among the voters. So, I mean, it is so difficult for the politician to remain in his true, true self, <clears throat> to remain true, to be honest. And also, many people simply believe that in politics, honesty doesn't pay. If you're honest, you're against a very uh, uh, um, um, cunning opponent uh, who never cares about honesty, then always uh, he will have the upper hand. You will lose out. This is what many politicians believe. But having been involved in politics myself for almost 20 years, I, uh, I strongly believe that in the long term, honesty is appreciated by people. Yes, we don't have too many honest politicians, but those who are really respected by the people are seen to be honest. So honesty, this is one principle. Another principle that I believe a good politician, a good political leader should adhere to <clears throat> is the sense of accountability. You must know very clearly what your responsibilities are and you must shoulder your responsibility without any um, <clears throat> without running away. Again, those political leaders whom I respect most will always, you know, let the buck stop on his desk. Now, there are those bad leaders who, whenever things go wrong, would try to put the blame on his colleagues, on other members in the team. And whenever there is any uh, uh, success, you always say, it's, you know, you see, it's my leadership. It's my leadership. They will always put credit on themselves and always lay the blame on others. Now, if a leader behaves in that way, the team members will very soon go away. Or even if they have to stay on his team, they cannot really um, work with him wholeheartedly. So, this Responsibility, the principle, the willingness to take up responsibility, especially when things do not go the way they're supposed to, this is another important uh, quality of a good leader. Um, <clears throat> Finally, I think a good leader must also have a very clear view, have a very clear understanding of where he's going to take his team, where he's going to take the community, for example, if you are a community leader. <clears throat> you must have a set of clear political ideals, principles, convictions, 
to guide you whenever you have to make difficult decisions, important decisions uh, in leading your team. So you have to, you have to be um, knowledgeable enough both in politics and also in the actual conditions you're faced with, you must be able to analyze situation very carefully and understand what is the right way to move forward. And then of course, your set of political ideals must be righteous. Righteousness is as important as anything else. You must convince yourself, you must be able to believe yourself that what you do is actually for the good of the largest number of people. So, I mean, these are some of the, uh, I believe, the, uh, the ethical principles that a good leader, a good political leader in particular, must pay attention to. Now, what I've told you, <clears throat> most, of, most of it can be found uh, on the internet. Some, some of the points have been drawn from my own personal experience. But let me, before I stop, let me say this. No two good political leaders are similar to one another. All good leaders have their own particular traits, own skills, own personal um, um, characteristics. We can watch others leading, we can pay attention to what good leaders around us do and try to learn from them, but if you really aspire to, become, to becoming a good leader, you have to find your own way. You have to, you must try to understand yourself as much as you can first. And make yourself a good leader in your own way. So, um, and after all, everyone, every one of us, I believe, must have been in some position of leadership in one way or another, or many of us will, many of you will become leaders in future in various uh, um, organizations, in various teams. A few of you may become political leaders as well. If uh, sometime in future you find that what I'm telling you today is of political use, then maybe. Uh, uh, your patience in the last 30 minutes uh, does pay. So let me stop here. We have about uh, another half an hour for comments and uh, questions. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I, I missed the last part of the question. Yeah. Okay, so although we know your belief in modesty is very strong, what was your very, uh, what was the most memorable experience as a politician demonstrating this trait, skill, or integrity that you mentioned? <laughs> I can't, no, sorry, that is. Well, okay. Uh, I started the political party 25 years ago, um, as Samjin told you earlier. 
Um, <clears throat> we were in a very difficult situation then. The um, party, very few of us had any experience. The, 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 the sole purpose of forming the party was to take part in uh, elections, of course, in political elections. Now, I had no experience in elections before. I used to work in a school before getting involved in politics. And very few of the founding members of the party actually had any um, experience in election either. So it was difficult for us. And um, <clears throat> the first large scale election we took part in was the district council election in uh, 1994. So it was uh, 20 years ago now. We um, lost in over half of the constituencies. We only got, uh, I think, uh, less than 40% of, uh, of, of our candidates uh, elected. <coughs> And then right after that, we had to go for the Legislative Council election in 1995. Now, um, again, we did rather poorly in that election, 1995. I was chairman of the party. <clears throat> I stood in one of the uh, geographic constituencies and I lost. And we had seven candidates standing in the geographic constituencies and five of them, five of us lost. We were, you know, very disappointed, of course, and the party suffered a great uh, defeat. And many of us um, sort of panicked. We were not sure whether the party could still continue. We have examples of parties, both in Hong Kong and elsewhere, uh, being entirely wiped out after a very bad loss, a very bad defeat in the general election. <clears throat> so, but you see, this is the uh, <clears throat> Mathematics, mathematical training I got in college, uh, which uh, I found useful. Because in mathematics, when you find a problem, when you see a problem, when you come across a problem, the, the only thing you can do is to work out a solution, right? Work out a solution. So to me, we had a problem. We had suffered a very bad defeat in the general election. Should we dissolve the party? No way. Right? We spent a few years working so hard to put together the party. We couldn't. We couldn't possibly simply walk away. So the only thing we could do was to find a way to, to make everybody stay together. And I believe, I believe that I did quite a good job remaining calm, right? Not panicking, telling everybody, look, we are a new party, yes, we have suffered a great loss. The sensible thing to do is to, you know, learn from our experience and do better next time. And because I didn't panic, others stayed calm as well. I remember that one, at least one staff, a full-time staff employed by the party, was very curious. She asked me, look, Mr. Zhang, do you think that the, the, the defeat is trivial? Do you think that it doesn't uh, affect in any way the future of the party? How can you be so indifferent? How can you stay calm? And I said, I said to her, well, if I panic, if I panic like everybody else, does it help? Doesn't help. So the sensible thing to do is to stay calm. And that is what I meant when I told you 
as a leader, you must have the ability to cope with these, you know, sometimes uh, very unexpected situations which can be, can be disastrous if not controlled effectively. So, yes, I think uh, we, I mean, my party has gone through a number of very um, serious uh, frustrations in the last 25 years. And I think at least during the first 10 years when I was, when I was uh, the, the, the party leader, when I was the chairman, um, the ability for me to stay um, sober, calm, uh, was, was a very important factor. Okay. okay um, so the next question is, in your television with Regina, it, you said that without new po political talent, it would be hard for the government to function. How can students be more passionate about Hong Kong affairs? How can international school students be more grounded in their Hong Kong identity? Again, my <laughs> sense of hearing is not good. What about you, Regina? I only, yeah? Um, in your television sh talk show with Regina Ip, yes? you said that without new political talent, the government wouldn't be able to function. Uh -huh. And how can students be more passionate about Hong Kong affairs, and how can international school students especially ah. be more grounded in their Hong Kong identity? Ah, invite Regina to come and talk to you. Now, honestly, first of all, honestly, Regina is one of the best political leaders I have seen. Yes. Right? She may not be liked by some people, but I can tell you this. Uh, members in her team, those who have worked with her, always uh, are very loyal to her because they like working with her. She's, she's the kind of leader that can inspire uh, confidence in uh, people she, she leads. Well, your question. Uh, yes, we, we, have a, we have a lack of political talent in Hong Kong. And, uh, and, and there are good reasons because, you know, uh, Good people don't choose to go into politics. That's what, that's what the Xi Wai Leung said about 30 years ago. Hmm? I always quote him, and he, he, still, he still remembers it. See, see, he never denies it. He, uh, he was in a, at an interview <clears throat> about 30 years ago. Someone asked him, would you become Hong Kong's political leader? He said, no. Why? He said, look, in Hong Kong, all first-rate talent would only go into business. Only third-raters would become politicians. <laughs> That's what he said, all right? Huh? Perhaps he provides an example to that. He provides an example for that. But it has been the case in Hong Kong for the last many, many decades. Hmm? People who are good at studies, people, you know, intelligent people, they would rather choose to go into business than go into politics. Politics is not a, not a very attractive career for young people in Hong Kong. Now, tell me, before answering your question, how many of you here really want to go into politics? Huh? Ah, ah quite a few. Quite a few. Oh, becoming more. <laughs> Strange. But this is interesting. Are you honest? Are you honest? <laughs> okay. Ah, maybe. Maybe this is the reason why you have chosen to come to this school, right? Hmm? Well, I think if this is an international school, you do have a rather international mix of students in the school, do you, right? Hmm? 
you have, you know, of course I know that uh, uh, many of you are local students, but still, uh, there are many studying in, in the same classroom as you do who have, you know, an international background. And I think this is good. Um, this gives every one of you a good opportunity to learn about other cultures, to learn about other um, nationalities, people coming from very different backgrounds. And I think this is one important, again, another important quality of a good leader. Hmm? Cross-cultural communication and cooperation. Because we are, every day we are talking of a globalized world. And to become a leader, in particular a political leader, in the, in the present world, you must be able to understand people coming from cultural backgrounds very different from yours, and to work with them. And this is what uh, some people call uh, CQ. You have IQ, intelligence quotient, and then emotion quotient, and then this cultural quotient, or cultural aspect of the intelligence quotient to be able to work together with people of other cultures. And I think in, a national, uh, in an international community like this, uh, you have a much better chance of you know, learning to work together, learning to live with people coming from very different back cultural backgrounds. So this is important. Another thing, the fact that, well, you're interested in listening to me, again, perhaps tells that at least many of you are interested in politics. And that is important. Keep your interests alive. Hmm? Continue to pay attention to what's happening around you in, our, in the local community and also elsewhere, hmm? in the international uh, arena. Keep your eyes open. I, I can't think of any other, other way of uh, you know, preparing yourself to become politicians. But before seriously consider going into politics in Hong Kong, ask yourself once more, do you really want to put yourself in the place of people like uh, Si Wai Leung, or even Regina Yip, huh? or long hair? All right? Ask yourself before you uh, make up your mind. Okay, uh, thank you for answering. Here's my third question. What do you think will happen to Hong Kong in 2047 when the 50 years no change rule of basic law ends? What's going to happen in 2047? <clears throat> we know that the basic law promises 50 years, no change. Right? One country, two systems for 50 years without any change. However, no one from the Chinese government has said that in 2047, Hong Kong must change. There will have to be change. Now, what's going to happen in 2047 will depend entirely on what will happen from now to that year in the intervening 30 years. Think of this. If one country, two systems, if this arrangement continues to work well, if what we do as citizens of Hong Kong and what the central government officials do in the coming years can convince everybody including the young people in Hong Kong, like you, and the international world, that one country, two systems, really works for Hong Kong. That it will be for the greatest benefit of both the country, both China and Hong Kong, for us to continue with the system. Then I don't think that there is any reason for anybody 
to want changes in 2047. Now, on the contrary, if we cannot make one country, two systems succeed, if uh, the government, the Hong Kong government, finds it more and more difficult to govern effectively, if more and more people go into the streets shouting for Hong Kong independence, hmm? <laughs> and if someday the central government officials no longer believe in the viability of one country, two systems, they no longer believe that they can allow Hong Kong people to, you know, look after our own affairs <clears throat> without things getting out of control, then I believe that even, I'm afraid, even before 2047 comes, one country, two systems may be the casualty first. So, um, well, yes, this is an, an international community, but I still believe that most of you are going to spend uh, a large part of your life in Hong Kong. Huh? Or aren't you? So, make sure, make sure that what you're going to do in the next few years, the next decade, when you, say, become uh, um, a responsible citizen in Hong Kong, make sure that everything you do will be uh, good for one country, two systems will help to hold one country, two systems intact. This is important, right? So, so what we do now up to 2047 will decide Hong Kong's fate after 2047. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. And finally, are there any questions from the audience? So teachers and uh, students, if you have any questions, Yeah, yeah. Sorry, once again. You see, I, I, I haven't, I haven't taken any training in listening. You see, that's quite obvious. Like, how do you feel that being a CEO of a really big company is different from being a CEO of a leader? Like, how does it work? I can't answer your question because I have never been a CEO of a big company. I don't know. Well, um, I, I'm. I guess it is, it is very, it is not easy at all to be a good CEO of a big company these days. I think it's, uh, I mean, uh, management is becoming a more and more professional, complicated, sophisticated um, um, skill. So I always, I always admire those people who can run a big uh, organizations, big corporations, very effectively. I guess uh, a, a good CEO must share some of the uh, qualities that any leader, any good leader must possess. Right? Some of the things, the ability to communicate with people, the ability to uh, handle uh, uh, crisis, uh, likability, and so on, but um, this, as a CEO of a company, of course, the most important thing is you must understand the mission of the company. You must know what uh, you want the company to do in the future, where you are leading, leading your, your staff to. Uh, as compared to, say, a political leader who, who is sort of, sort of guided by his political beliefs. Hmm? 
I, I think that perhaps that's the most important difference. Otherwise, I, I really can't answer your question very uh, confidently because I've never been a CEO. <laughs> Did I see another? Huh? Okay. Why is it exactly that the chief executive is elected by China instead of the Hong Kong people? Because it's one country, two sisters. No, but it's not China. Huh? It's well, like, no. We, well, yes. We have to. I think. I think. First of all, we must realize that Hong Kong is part of China and Hong Kong, Hong Kong's relations with the central government and with other parts of China is quite different from um, that of an ordinary city and the, and the country. Um, and in addition to that, of course, China, up to now, is not a democracy. I mean, we all know that. So the Chinese government itself is not elected by the people, by popular vote. And sovereignty and the um, <clears throat> integrity of sovereign of sovereignty is so important to China you know the, the Chinese government went into a lot of uh, 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 trouble to make a deal with the British government the sino British joint declaration on how Hong Kong should return to China and it is understandable that the most the greatest concern of the central government is that Hong Kong must be in the hands of someone they can fully trust. Now, let me add, before returning to China, Hong Kong was under British rule for one and a half centuries. And most people, most Hong Kong people, when Hong Kong returned to China, 20 years, 20 years ago, most Hong Kong people were happier with the British system, the British rule in Hong Kong, than with what they saw happening across the border in other parts of China. Right? So, so, so there must be good reasons for China, for the Chinese leadership, to feel worried that Hong Kong people would not become truly loyal to the country after Hong Kong's return. That's why they find it so important that they must have someone they can trust to, you know, uh, take the helm in the Hong Kong government. So what's written in the basic law is a kind of compromise. Hong Kong people can, you know, choose, can elect our own person to become the chief executive, but the central government has the final power to decide whether that person or she can really take a post or not. So this is the, uh, well, you may see that as a kind of balance. Hmm? Now on the other hand, you say, you said that China chooses the chief executive. Well, China cannot choose anyone totally rejected by Hong Kong people. That's another reality, right? Yes, many of you may like uh, John Zhang, who shares my family name, right? Uh, better than Carrie Lam, but I think the fact is, most, many people in Hong Kong 
have very little against Cary Lamb either. They may like John better because John is the more likable person, right? But with Carrie, well, to most people, she's still, she's also all right. So if, I think, before Carrie stood uh, for the candidacy, many of us believed that CY was going to go for a second term, right? Did you? Did you think that CY must be going for a second term? All right. And also, although CY gave you know, personal reasons, family reasons for, um, to explain why he decided not to go again, not to go for a second term, I think most people believed that it was the uh, decision in Beijing that Beijing decided that CY should not stay on for the second term. Do you think so? Do you think it was Beijing who decided? Yes, yes. Now, if that's the case, think of this. If that is the case, let us ask why. Why did Beijing, why did the central government decide not to allow CY to go for a second term? We all know that the central government had a lot of trust in CY. The central government had no question at all about CY's loyalty to the country. And the central government, I believe, at least those in the top uh, uh, <coughs> positions, uh, never doubted CY's ability. They thought he was doing a good job. So why? Why did they let him go? To me, I can, only th I can only think of one answer. Because Beijing, the central government, knew that CY was not popular among Hong Kong people. That many Hong Kong people dislike it. Hmm? Do you like CY? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, very good. You <laughs> should. All right, good. I don't know. Well, you should invite CY here and tell him you like him, right? You know, give him support, give him support. But you see, that, that's the answer to the question, to the question raised by the young lady. Beijing, they understand they cannot pick someone who most Hong Kong people don't want. This is it. So this is, this is a balance. Huh? Hong Kong people cannot pick someone Beijing do not accept. And Beijing cannot pick someone Hong Kong people do not accept either. So this is it. Hmm?